The Bible is the word of Almighty God. Therefore, it does not need to be defended, only understood. The purpose of this program is to present to you, our viewers, the key to understanding the scriptures. There is within the pages of the Bible itself a God-given design for studying the Bible. All the confusion that exists within Christianity today is the result of two failures. Number one, ignoring God's design for Bible study, and number two, failing to believe what the Bible actually says. We remind you of what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew 5.18, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall abide forever. We're instructed in Romans 3.4, Let God be true, but every man a liar. We are informed by 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And as well, God tells us how to study his word in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rather dividing the word of truth. That's God's design, rather dividing the word of truth. Not according to your liking, not into verses you want or don't want to obey, but making distinctions where God makes distinctions. Obeying that portion of the Bible that is specifically addressed to us today. Now, now our speaker, Dr. James Chisholm. Both by way of introduction uh, to the lesson this evening and also to illustrate the significance of it, I would like to relate to you an encounter I had several years ago with a young man. This young man, after probably his first attempt at reading the Bible in his adult life with a sincere effort to understand it, approached me and said, Jim, I don't think I can ever make it to heaven. It was kind of an unusual response to someone or an unusual approach by someone who had just finished reading the Bible because I had always associated the Bible with bringing comfort to someone, and this man looked somewhat distressed, indeed even shaken. But he said, after reading the Bible, I don't think I can make it to heaven. And I asked him, why not? He says, well, I was reading all the rules and regulations, and I don't think that I certainly, there's no way that I can keep them, and I've already broken most of them. I asked him where he was reading from, and he said, and he pointed back to the Bible, he, he opened it up, he didn't know the books, but he opened back up to where he was, and he opened it to Exodus and Leviticus, where he was reading. And in it, of course, contains many rules and regulations, even indeed hundreds of them. And I told him he didn't have to worry about that if he could be forgiven for that. And he said, well, even if I could be forgiven... I still couldn't make it because there's no way that I can keep all of these laws. And of course these were the laws that were given from God to Moses to the people of Israel and there were hundreds of them and some of the penalties for breaking them were very severe. Many of them indeed the penalty was death. But I told him that he didn't have to worry about that, that, we are no, that that was the law and that concerned Israel. And that was the Old Testament, that we're under the New Testament, a new dispensation that God was, was now doing business with man under a different way, and that was grace. So I told him that the Old Testament was the law, and the New Testament was grace. But upon further examination, I, find, I found out that that wasn't true at all. That indeed, the Old Testament didn't, the uh, Old Testament did not end, or the law did not end at the so-called New Testament at Matthew, that it began somewhere else. So that's the thing that I would like to explore today. When did this new way of doing business with man begin? Did it begin at Matthew or did it begin somewhere else? And why is it really important? What's the significance of it? And why should we study to find out when did a new dispensation begin and an old one end? We must find out what the rules are for today, when it was brought in, and by whom it was brought. Because we may try to commend ourselves to God in a matter or in a manner that is totally inappropriate for today, and in a manner that is totally impossible today. Now, many people again teach that the Old Testament is the law and the New Testament is grace. And that we need to pay attention to what is in the New Testament and not necessarily what's in the Old Testament except on certain issues. On issues, for example, like money. 
even so-called New Testament preachers will say that we're still under the law of tithing and will use the New Testament admonition of Malachi to substantiate that, the Old Testament admonition in Malachi to substantiate that. Now someone recently said to me when I was talking to them about much the same issue, I wish it was simple. I wish there was a place in the Bible that said that we are no longer under this dispensation, but now we're under this dispensation. That would make it much easier, and I wouldn't have such difficulty with it. Well, indeed, there is such a place that tells us that we are no longer in the old dispensation, but we're under a new dispensation, a new way that God is doing business with man today. Now, the lesson this evening, of course, is not going to be an exhaustive look at the subject, but simply a sample to give you an idea that perhaps you can use it as a springboard for further study to find out when did the dispensation of grace begin? And does the New Testament teach all grace and the Old Testament teach all law? Now, I think before we do that, of course, we have to define what is grace. Grace, of course, has been defined by most people as being something that we receive from God that we do not deserve and cannot earn. But I think if we look at the Bible, we can see, of course, we can get a clear picture of what grace is as well. The Bible says, Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So we know that grace is not works. Also in Titus 3, 5, it says essentially the same thing. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us with a washing and regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. So again, we have grace being the absolute antithesis of works. It is absolutely not works. So let's define grace that way. Again, it is something that we receive from God that we cannot earn and do not deserve. And we know another thing, that it is not works. That it is simply nothing more than a free gift from God. So let's look in the New Testament and let's see if indeed this is where grace began. Did grace begin with the Lord's earthly ministry as He walked the earth. We know that grace and truth come by Jesus Christ, but did He bring it with Him when He came, and did He preach about it during His earthly ministry? We're simply going to look at a few illustrations to make the point in the Gospels. If you have a Bible, you can turn with me, or you can, I don't mean to make you weary with Scripture, with giving you a lot of Scripture references, but you can either write it down or you can follow along with me. But let's open your Bibles to Matthew, to, excuse me, to Mark, the 8th chapter, the 34th verse, and we read, And when he had called the people unto him, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. We certainly don't see any grace there we see that it's pretty hard. It says denial, it requires self-denial, picking up the cross, and following Jesus Christ. That's not a free gift. It is something that you must do. We can also look, when we want to find out, if we want to find out how to be saved, or what we must do to be saved, and many times this particular scripture that I'm going to give you now is used inappropriately. And that is Mark, just a couple of chapters later, Mark, the, seventh, the tenth chapter, beginning at verse 17. And when he was gone forth onto the way, there came one running, and kneeled to him, that is, kneeling before Jesus, and asked him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now this is specific. This man is asking the Lord, what must I do in order to inherit eternal life. And let's see if what the Lord is saying has anything to do with a free, with a free gift or grace. Jesus, of course, answers and said, 
Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And now he gets to the crux of his question. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and mother. And he answered and said unto him, Master, all of these have I observed from my, from my youth. And Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come, take up thy cross, and follow me. Do we at this point see anything that has to do with grace? Certainly not. The Lord says very specifically, you must keep the commandments, you must sell everything that you have, take, pick up your cross, and follow Him. So again we find nothing to do with grace at this point in the Lord's ministry here on earth. But let's go ahead and look at probably the very last thing that the Lord talked about, the very last thing that He said that is recorded during His stay on earth. And this was after His ascension or rather, excuse me, after his resurrection and before his ascension, and he's standing and he gives what is commonly called the Great Commission to his disciples. In Matthew chapter 28, beginning at verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. This is the very last thing that the Lord Jesus Christ talked about, or very last instructions to His disciples that the Lord Jesus Christ had given prior to His ascension to heaven. And during the last thing that He said, He said nothing about grace. He said, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And of course, what he commanded them to do was everything that was written in the law. And chapter 23 of Matthew, verse, beginning at verse 1, confirms that. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, that is, the seat of authority. And therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. So the Lord Jesus is telling them to do everything that the scribes and Pharisees tell them to do. But of course, he goes on to say, do as they tell you, not as they do because they do, they say and do not. So the Lord Jesus in his last utterance prior to being taken up to heaven said, go into all the world baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you to do, which was of course keep the law and not a word yet do we have of grace, a free gift, something unmerited, something undeserved, something you don't have to work for. Most people, or many people, will say, yes, well, it wasn't mentioned there, but it was mentioned later on, and almost immediately, after the Lord had ascended to heaven, we know that the time of grace began somewhere about Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit descended on everyone. But let's look and see if indeed that is the case. As a matter of fact, let's look all the way over to the 10th chapter of Acts, and let's see if we find anything about grace even in the 10th chapter of Acts. Now this is, and let's look into Acts 10, verse 35, no, let's look at verse 34. Now this is Peter. It says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. This was right after Peter had a vision and he was, it was told to him that, the God, that God was, would save Gentiles as well. It says, he goes on to say in verse 35, But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. 
again, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. So here again, as late as the 10th chapter of the book of Acts, we still find no mention of grace freely given without merit, without works. Because again, it's he that feareth him and worketh righteousness. Remember I quoted earlier, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness. Well, when does it begin? Sometime between Acts 10 and somewhere between Acts 10 and Titus. So let's turn over a couple of more chapters and we'll look at the 13th chapter of Acts. And now we're here the Apostle Paul who has recently come on the scene. And beginning at verse 37 of chapter 13, he says, But he whom God raised again saw no corruption. Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. That is through this man, Jesus Christ. And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now we see the first mention of grace here. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe, not all them that worketh righteousness, but all them that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So now we see the first mention of, of grace here, of simply believing, not working righteousness. And we hear it from the Apostle Paul. Now the Apostle Paul mentions it again and again throughout the books of, book of Acts, but then he proceeds to nail it down with an absolute certainty in his epistles, beginning in his epistle to the Romans. In Romans, the sixth chapter, in verse 14, we can look, and remember I said, someone once asked me, I wish there was a place in the Bible that said that we are no longer under law, that we don't have to do that anymore, that now we have something new. Well, this is it. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now we have an absolute new dispensation. It is nailed down that we are no longer under law, but we are under grace. This is the reign of grace, a rule of grace, the administration of grace, the dispensation of grace. This is what we are under now, and this is what we hear of from this time forward in Paul's epistles. Now again, this is of critical importance when this began, because we cannot attempt to commend ourselves to God in a way that's impossible to do today. Well, let's turn back now to the next book, 1 Corinthians, and let's look in chapter 9 and verse 17, verse 16. Paul, writing, says, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. He does not equivocate. He says the dispensation of the gospel is committed to me. Turn back to, to Ephesians, and he continues. with the same theme. Chapter 3, verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. And then in Colossians 1.25, and let me again say, Paul says, is given me to you word. And that is very significant that he says, given me. He says it again in Colossians. We'll turn over there. 
Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now again, and, and he says it in Corinthians, in Ephesians, and in Colossians. He says, the dispensation has been given to me to give to you. And it's critical that we understand this. It's critical that we understand what he does not say. Many people think that he is simply preaching the same gospel that was given to the twelve apostles. But what he does not say is a disp the dispensation that was given to the twelve apostles has been passed on to me to pass on to you. He said, the dispensation has been given to me to give to you. I recall when I was a, a very young boy, when I, my, my father bought me a first, my first bicycle. And he told me that my sisters could ride it periodically. And not to be selfish with it, I had two older sisters. But there was one thing certain, he gave the bicycle to me. And I knew that. Had he given the bicycle to us, had he given the bicycle to the three of us, it would have been presumptuous of me to say that Dad gave me a bike. And it would have been presumptuous of Paul to say a dispensation of the gospel has been given to me if it was given to someone else, if it was given to us. But again and again throughout Paul's epistles, he speaks of, or he speaks of himself frequently. He talks about me, he talks about my gospel, and he says the gospel has been given to me to give to you. I hope that much of what I've said has, has cleared up some of the, the exasperation that, that you, perhaps you experience, that I know that I experience in my Bible study. I have a, had an extremely difficult time reconciling Paul's writings with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Always I would look back and I would see things in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I knew that was the New Testament, and I was always told that the New Testament was what I had to pay attention to. But yet I would look back there and I would see things that didn't reconcile quite with what the Apostle Paul said. The Apostle Paul said, be loving, kind, tender-hearted one to another, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And yet in Matthew it says that if you forgive not your brother his trespasses, the Father will not forgive you your trespasses. Which one was right? It's simply the matter is, is that the dispensation of the grace of God did not begin until the Apostle Paul and was made increasingly clear to him throughout his ministry all the ramifications of what God was doing in this dispensation or in this period of time, Paul made increasingly more clear as he went along. The only thing that we really have to understand at this point is how should we be saved at this time? You heard me quote that Paul says, all those that believe in him, believe what? Well, if let's turn back again to Corinthians, the 15th chapter. And we'll see what we need to believe and why we need to believe it. And this, hopefully it will make it clear that there's only one thing that we need to believe in this present dispensation in order to be saved. In chapter, chapter 15, verse 3, the Apostle Paul writing says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to scriptures. So all we have to do is believe just that, and nothing more. Romans 4, the fifth chapter, the, Romans the fourth chapter, the fifth verse says, But him that worketh not, 
but believe on him who justifies the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. And in Romans 3.22 it says, But now the righteousness of God by the faith of Jesus Christ is upon all and in all those who believe. So all we have to do is simply believe and to be saved. Not in our works and not in any works of righteousness which we've done, but what the Lord Jesus Christ himself has done for us. Does this dispensation and what I've said, does it negate what is written in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Certainly not. It does not. Those things are yet to come, a pass, to, come to pass when the Lord Jesus Christ establishes his kingdom here on earth. All the things that he wrote in the Sermon on the Mount, all the things that he spoke of on the Sermon on the Mount will begin to take place at his second advent when he comes back and establishes his kingdom here on earth. Thank you. We hope this program has been an eye-opener to you. We are not out to destroy anyone's faith, but to establish your faith upon the truth. Only then will you experience real liberty. The truth shall set you free. If we can be of any further assistance to you, we would love to help you. Or if we would like any of the free literature you see on your screen, you may call or write Grace Bible Church, 13630 Common Road, Warren, Michigan, 48093. Our phone number is area code 313-778-5032. Once again, that's Grace Bible Church, 13630 Common Road, Warren, Michigan, 48093. Area code 313-778-5032. This program was presented freely to you in cooperation with this local public cable station. Thank you for sharing this time with us. Join us again this time next week to learn more about God's message of grace. Until then, this is Daniel Schulert speaking for all of us at Grace Bible Church, praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe.